So, we've got a number one deluxe meal. Is there anything else I can get you? Yeah, I'd also like a good night's sleep. Maybe something like the I didn't struggle all night with my uncomfortable CPAP mask. Sir, I think what you're looking for is Inspire. It's an implant that works inside your body to treat sleep apnea without a CPAP. Come on. He sounds angry. Inspire, sleep apnea innovation. Inspire is not for everyone. Talk to your doctor to see if it's right for you. And review important safety information at InspireSleep.com. This podcast of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs is sponsored by AAA Heating and Air. Their premier HVAC company in the Midlands is growing. Are you a top HVAC technician? AAA Heating and Air is looking for dedicated applicants to fill their fast-growing service department with top-notch HVAC technicians. If you're the best, and they want you. If you're ready to stop working and start a career, you can earn up to $100,000 plus a year at AAA Heating and Air. Quality candidates will have at least two years' experience and a good driving record. Benefits include top industry salaries, commission on service and unit sales, set call limits, company-provided take-home vehicle and gas card, company-provided cell phone and tablet, health, dental, and vision benefits, 401k retirement plan with company match and scaled PTO based on length of service. Contact Roy and Dana Finley at 803-677-1500 or check out their job postings on Facebook or ZipRecruiter. Triple A air when you need us. Triple A heating and air. It's the Geek Got Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs, founded by Firemen with Chris Clark. The 2007 South Carolina class was, at that time, sixth in the country and fourth in the SEC. This is amazing. West Mitchell. You know, I think if you're South Carolina, you're you're aiming to, to at least be at 50%. Then in theory, you're adding talent, you're getting better, you're putting yourself in a position to compete. And Tyler Head. It's been a great week for South Carolina. On the recruiting front, still certainly plenty to talk about. On the home of the Gamecocks, 107.5 The Game. And welcome into the Gamecocks Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs here on 107.5 The Game. Tyler Head and Wes Mitchell along with you in the Herndon Chevrolet Studios. Chris Clark going to join us today via the phone as he's out tending to some business. Guys, we are literally right at 24 hours since Dylan Stewart made his commitment while we were on the air for yesterday's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. You've had 24 hours to marinate on. Obviously, you guys were very, very busy yesterday with all the coverage of this commitment. Um, I don't know. What's your thoughts now that a a day has passed? Yeah, um, well, I'll say first of all, Tyler, what what were you thinking when I said, uh, Tyler, go to break right now? I had no clue. I, I thought I thought this was, I, I had no clue. Honestly, you took me by surprise. I'm like, usually we talk about these things beforehand yeah. if we're going to do something like this. But as soon as I got on Twitter at the commercial break, I'm like, oh, I get it. That makes sense. Yeah, well, the, the interesting thing about this one was that, you know, we anticipated if nothing changed that it was going to be South Carolina. And... You know, we, we felt like South Carolina had been in a good spot and that they were in a really good spot after, you know, this most recent visit. The, the question with Dylan Stewart has just always been, when would he do it? And, you know, he, he's a guy who never really locked that down. It, it did move around a little bit, uh, but even when it was sort of solidified, when he did it, it was more of like, a, hey, it could be in the next month or so. Sure. Um, you know, it wasn't like... It could be this week. It wasn't like it's going to be this day, and then it changed. So, you know, I, I thought that was actually the biggest surprise of the whole thing was that he just up and decided to do it. Um, as far as him, the prospect, I, I feel like I, uh, I've i talked about um, for the last 24 hours uh, on here, on our show, on other shows, um, going to the grocery store. Like, every everybody is talking about Dylan Stewart. And uh, Chris... You know, you and I got to talk with Charles Power some yesterday on the podcast. And, um, you know, I, I thought just really gave us some some in-depth insight on what makes this guy um, one of the best prospects in the entire country. Yeah, and I, I thought, you know, you look at what Charles, he put out something on Twitter. Or, are we going to call it X or Twitter? We're just going to keep Twitter, right? Can we do that? Can we establish we're, our editorial? Yeah, sure. Guideline? We're going Twitter. Although I got to say, okay. I do actually kind of like the icon, but that's uh, that's another story for another day. We, we can go with Twitter for now. <laughs> we'll stay away from that. What about the big blinking sign? 
that Elon has in, in San Francisco. I'm, I'm glad I don't live across, across from it. I'll say that much. I think they took it, it down, it, but... Yes, there's a lot of talk about taking it down. But uh, anyway, not to get us too off track, you know, Charles did put out something. And basically, you know, right now, I think Wes, correct me if I'm wrong, on three has him for their individualized rankings, number two in the country, right behind Colin Simmons from Texas in terms of just positionally, right, edge prospects. He's got a number two in the on three industry ranking, which is the weighted average of all four major recruiting services. He is also, you know, the number two edge in the country. But Charles put something out on Twitter yesterday basically saying, hey, this this guy basically has kind of the highest upside, best combination of a few different critical factors that you look for in a defensive end, which I, I thought was really interesting. You know, as Charles pointed out, you know, Dylan has – he gained probably 20 pounds – um, from, you know, sophomore to junior season or sophomore season until now. Uh, so he's 6'5", 250, which is, I mean, exactly how you want um, an SEC defensive end pass rusher to look like. The production is there, right? It, you know, production is such a big thing um, at the high school level. If you're a, a big-time pass rusher, purportedly, you want to see that production, right? And so 16 sacks as a junior, lining up all over the place, that, that shows it. And then you go to the traits, right? 6'5", 250. He's got 33-and-a-half-inch arms. Um, he can, he's been timed in the 4'6 range at that size. Uh, just long arms. So a lot of the, the quote-unquote, to use the scouting term, the projectable traits that you would look at, Dylan Stewart has those in spades. So it's one thing if you have, you know, if you had a, a kind of an undersized, just really good high school player who racked up, you know, 10, 15 sacks, you go, that guy's a really good high school player. Does it translate with this guy? He's got the production, but he also has measurables, tools, traits that translate to the SEC and beyond. I mean, Dylan Stewart is the type of guy that when you look at NFL traits, he has, um, you know, that kind of first round, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but he has, uh, the type of physical traits you would see in like a first round type pass rusher. And that's why he's a five star right now. Well, and uh, like you said, that's why, you know, you, these guys get these five star ratings because based on everything that is seen through the recruiting process, they are thought to be guys that have the potential to be first round draft picks in the NFL, especially when you're talking about somebody that's a consensus five star across the board, which makes it all the more funny that, and I know Chris, you and I talked about this while, while Wes was out taking a phone call yesterday, but it makes it all the more kind of funny that he didn't have a formal announcement like we see a lot of these huge recruits like him typically do. Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, he just kind of, Dylan's a little bit more of a low-key guy. I mean, I, I, when I went up, I was covering, um, I believe it was last August, Desmond Yumi Azulu's announcement, and so I went by and I saw Nick Harbor and I saw Dylan Stewart, and you know Dylan is—he's just a—he's a quieter guy. Um, obviously, he's taken lots and lots of recruiting visits. Yeah, he puts out some things on social media every now and then. You know, some edits that schools send him, some videos, but he's just—he's really not all about the recruiting. He kind of has kept his head down with all of it. Um, and, you know, I, I don't mind it either way, personally. I mean, there, <laughs> Wes knows. I mean, we talk about this all the time, kind of behind the scenes. There are certain guys that are maybe uh, more fun to cover than others, more difficult to cover than others. At the end of the day, it's, it's a prospect's recruitment. However he wants to run it is how he can run it. So I'm not one of those that's like, oh, I, I get irritated if you, you know, carry some fanfare in your recruiting or if you have an announcement or have a little fun with it. That, that's fine. But it is, I think, nonetheless pretty neat that a guy, like you said, Tyler, of his caliber decided, I'm just going to – I'm just tweeting something out. I'm just putting out a graphic. I'm not, I'm not tweeting out that I'm cutting my list down. I'm not tweeting out that, hey, I'm going to announce it this time on this day. Like, just here it is. It's done. I'm finished with the process. And um, I, think, I thought it was pretty neat and um, obviously a big, big day for South Carolina. And uh, by the way, a great graphic um, incorporating yeah. the uh, the cotton gin sign in there. Uh, Hayes Fawcett does a great job with those, uh, you know, on a national level. But I, I thought that one was fantastic. Um, 
So the the other thing about Charles Power is he kind of, I think as much as recruiting is an art, at least in terms of evaluating guys and building a roster and everybody has their way of doing things, Charles really tries to do everything he can to boil it down into a science. And it's kind of, can you check off all the boxes that would, I look at it as percentages. Can you check off all the boxes that increase the percentages of you being a successful college football player? And then I think it's, can you check the boxes that would increase the percentages that you can be an impact college football player? And obviously there, there are no sure things that does not exist in sports or life, but if you check every single one of those boxes, then the chances, especially these days, it seems like more and more the five-star guys tend to pan out because there's just so much extra media attention on recruiting that just did not exist before. I think it's interesting to also note, Chris, that um, for what Charles told us, there just really aren't that many guys in this class this year that have or that possess the skill set Dylan Stewart does, that's context we maybe don't think of normally. We think, oh, you know, number 10 player in the country, number one or two edge prospect in the country. That's awesome regardless of what year. But the fact that you're sitting there as South Carolina, you need you needed a guy like this in your class. You needed a guy like this on your roster, to be frank, to add to that room as you sort of project forward the next few years. Well, you look around, there's, there's not – 15 guys in the country that can do what this kid does. There, there are, there's not five guys that can do what this kid does at that position. So I, I think that's some important context to this, to how important of a get this is, that it, it's kind of a down year at that position once you get past the, the first few guys. Yeah, that, I mean, that can be huge for you as you bring him in, continue to build the program. Then, then if you can stack you know, more guys, you know, say not only in this class, you can add another guy or two, whether it's a high school guy, a portal guy, a JUCO guy, but then into 2025, you know, if you're still landing, not necessarily a guy Dylan Stewart's caliber, right? But if you can land, you know, a high four-star guy or two in the 2025 class, certainly with Sterling Lucas at the helm, you know, of recruiting the edge position, you're going to have a chance to be in with some big-time guys. And so if you can stack, start stacking talent, like Dylan Stewart, like Desmond Yumi Azulu, you're going to be pretty good in a hurry in that room. And I think, Wes, just going back to the traits, like if you look at the uh, the top five guys, according to on three's individualized rankings, um, if you look at them, you know, Colin Simmons, who's number one, he's 6'2 and a half, 225. Elijah Rushing, who's actually committed to Arizona, who's right behind Dylan Stewart, he's 6'6, 225. Jordan Ross, is six four and a half two fifteen. Marquise Lightfoot from Chicago is committed to Miami, six five two twenty. Right now, some of these guys they'll get bigger. Right, they'll put on weight in college. Point is, Dylan Stewart in that top five is kind of an outlier with his traits. He's already six five two fifty. Already can run like he does. Already has that production. So, I think that's why he's so high. And I think it also illustrates Charles's point in that he he doesn't. You know, not a lot of guys in this class, at least, uh, have the skill set that he has. And so that's that's added value for South Carolina in this class on top of just getting a great player, on top of just, look, perception does matter in recruiting for a lot of different reasons. And, um, you know, you, you can't – you don't win games off perception, but it does help you in recruiting, which then helps you <laughs> in turn win games. And so – um, I think this is just such a, a massive commitment for, for all those reasons. Chris, a lot of times people ask us for player comps. I know we both kind of try to shy away from that. Um, it can be difficult to give, you know, if, if you give like this kind of upper level, uh, you know, this is like best case scenario. People are like, oh, you're comparing this guy to, you know, insert top five pick in the draft if you give somebody that's maybe a little bit more conservative it's oh well he's better than that um then you're trying to if you're giving a comp you're trying to give a comparison that you know it's a guy people know or it's kind of worthless if they don't but I, I do think it's interesting on three tries to incorporate at least for their upper level guys the top prospects they try to have a um he reminds us of section on these profiles yeah. and um 
Chris, I don't know how familiar you are with this guy, but I, I know uh, I thought this was an interesting player comparison. There's for Dylan Stewart is Jalen Phillips, who um, was in the 2017 class, I think initially was a five-star guy. Um, if you look at the industry rank, he actually was not the number one prospect on any one site. But as far as the average rating, he was actually the highest rated guy in that class. Went to UCLA out of high school, ended up transferring to Miami, then gets drafted by the Miami Dolphins and um, has had a really nice career so far. Collected a bunch of sacks during his first couple of seasons and uh, is a six, five and a half, 255 pound guy. So, um, I don't know if you remember Jalen Phillips much. He was a California guy, so not really in South Carolina's footprint. But for those who watch the NFL and for those who pay attention to that stuff and NFL draft and the the whole first round and all that stuff, I I thought uh, worthwhile to mention Jalen Phillips as on threes comparison for Dylan Stewart. Yeah, if Dylan Stewart turns out to be three quarters of a Jalen Phillips, you're happy. You know, I mean, you're right. And he was a first round pick. He's 18. If you're sitting here saying Dylan Stewart compares favorably and could end up being somewhat like this guy, that's a first round pick. That means you've landed yourself a great player. Uh, you're right. He, not only a first round pick, but he's lived up to it. I mean, first two seasons in the NFL, 15 and a half sacks, you know, combined. Um, he's been a really good player. So started, a, only started five games in year one and got eight and a half sacks and was almost a full time starter last year. So, I thought that was a neat comp, too. Size similarities, movement similarities. Um, he, Charles even pointed out there that there are some differences at the same stage, but a, a pretty good comp there for Dylan Stewart. And, again, I'd, I'd go back to that point. If, if he turns out to be close, close to Dylan Phillips, Gamecock fans are going to be really happy. All right, Chris, we'll let you go. Do what you need to do. We'll see you back in the studio tomorrow. But before – we let you go. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. 107.5, the game. I'm about to go see my kids here for an event. And uh, if you're a parent out there like me, you know you do absolutely anything for them. And that's why it's so important to protect your kids, your family, with life insurance from State Farm. I have a recommendation for just the person for you to talk to if you want to learn how to protect your family for an affordable price. That's State Farm agent Amy Mason Cup. She'll help make it easy and affordable to protect your family no matter what your future holds. Three convenient ways to get a hold of her and visit with her to find out what she can do for you. Her office is right off of I-26 at the St. Andrews Road exit, 612 St. Andrews Road, Suite 4 in Columbia. That's Ashland Park Plaza, again, just off I-26 at St. Andrews Road. You can also give her a call, 803-772-5554. Or her website, amymasoncup.com. That's A M Y M A S I N C U P P dot com. Amy is a South Carolina native and a local agent. She and her team can give you a personalized quote to meet your needs and help you save. Give her a call about life insurance to see how she can protect your family for an affordable price. But if you have other insurance questions, she can also help you with those too. Again, that's Amy Mason Cup. AmyMasonCup dot com. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. All right, Chris, we'll see you back in studio tomorrow. Uh, Coming up next, Wes and I will dive a little bit more into Sterling Lucas and the role he played in this commitment for Dylan Stewart. You're listening to the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs on 107.5 The Game. You loved Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. Is it weird having a million things to talk about and the only thing he wanted to talk about is Bravo? Yes, and it's always weird. It's like when I went to the White House Correspondents' Dinner and thought that this was my chance to like make a change, and they were like, well, enough about change. It's gotten to mind. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have so many questions for Howie that had nothing to do, and he was like, so scandal. Give Them Lala wherever you listen. Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Founded by Firemen. With Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head. On your home of the Gamecock. 107.5 The Game. Uh, yeah! And welcome back into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs here on 107.5 The Game. Tyler and Wes along with you. Chris will be back in studio with us tomorrow and Chris made a mention there just before we went to break of 
Sterling Lucas. And when you look at this commitment for Dylan Stewart, it's got Sterling Lucas's fingerprints all over it. And when you look at the recent commitments they've gotten out of that DMB area, Nicholas Harbor, Desmond Umelia Zulu, Sterling Lucas has proven to just have this area on lock, it seems like. And he's been such a vital part of pulling in these uh, great couple of recruiting classes here for the Gamecocks. Yeah, he, he's a rising star, man. And they, uh, so, so it, it's kind of a, a team effort as far as recruiting, you know, with this program, the way Beamer structures things. But, um, you know, you kind of have your recruiting area, but then obviously you have the uh, assistant coach that's with that position involved as well. And, you know, for, for Sterling Lucas, certainly you look at Dez, the job he did there, battling Ohio State actually, uh, to, to win him over as well. And then, um, was highly involved with Nicholas Harbor, uh, you know, from an area standpoint. And people forget, you know, originally we thought Harbor was going to be a pass rush guy. So that that was sort of part of that process was that he was heavily involved even once it transitioned into him being, okay, now he's going to be an offensive guy. Oh, hey, now he's actually going to play wide receiver, not tight end. You know, Lucas was still heavily involved, was there for the in-home, was there every step of the way, and it became really a – a big team recruiting battle there. But, you know, I, I think you look at what happened with Dylan Stewart. Obviously, Shane Beamer very involved from a head coach standpoint, probably more involved than than most head coaches out there. But as far as going up there and, and this being a, really a, a battle that, that was his to go win or lose, uh, you know, his position in an area that he recruits for South Carolina, uh, you know, this is this is one of his biggest wins, obviously, of his young career. Uh, shout out to him, by the way. Apparently, reading on Twitter, he was actually at the hospital yesterday mm. as this was happening. Wow. Um, as uh, he and his wife are uh, welcoming twins into the world. So Big day. Big, yeah, big week for Sterling Lucas. Uh, you know, congrats to him. I'm sure he will never forget this week uh, for a variety of reasons. But, man, he, he's a rising star. Born in 1990, so young guy, and, and I, I think really, really walks that line. I mean, I, I, I literally remember hearing about Sterling Lucas as a high school football player when he was in Orangeburg, and he's worked his way up, played ball at NC State, you know, coached at NC State, had his time at the NFL as a as an assistant and then made his way back to college, does a fantastic job of walking that line between being a guy who's young enough that he can connect with current players, you know, with prospects, with young guys. But also, he is a uh, consummate professional as well. And so he can connect with the parents and and the, you know, adult decision makers that are involved in the room as well. So I, I think... Uh, you know, you look at that, the fact he he just gets after it on the recruiting trail, that's that's half the battle is being willing to work at recruiting. But his ability to connect with pretty much anybody, he's one of those guys that can have a conversation with anybody in a room, and, and that will carry you a long way in recruiting. So throw in, you know, the fact you're in the SEC and can push that, the, the need South Carolina has at that position for somebody who can come in and play, you know, there, there were a lot of factors that, that went South Carolina's way here, but one of the biggest, if not the biggest, was Sterling Lucas. And Dylan Stewart actually now has a headshot of Sterling Lucas as his Twitter profile pic, which is uh, just perfect. Yeah, that's fantastic. And obviously a, a big part of, of getting Stewart in for this commitment for the class of 2024. We'll keep talking about this as the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour rolls on here on 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. 107.5 The Game. Guys, we tell you about Firehouse Subs every single day, and today is Wednesday, I think. Last I checked. That's correct. Tyler is shaking his head and telling me yes. So uh, today is Wednesday, which means it is my top sub as the sub of the day, the New York Steamer. Uh, I had never had pastrami before until I tried this sandwich. Now I order it probably about half the time I go to Firehouse Subs. So it's pretty much half New York Steamer. The other half is some combination of all the other things that I've tried and, and liked there. Um, one being Turkey Bacon Ranch, one being the new Pepperoni Pizza Meatball Sub, 
Um, one being the club on a sub. All different options you can have. But sub of the day is the way to go because you can get it for a discounted rate at firehousesubs.com. Or you can go with the Firehouse Subs app. That's the easiest way to do it. You can save your favorite subs on there. You can save your payment information on there. Then you can have them have it waiting for you very quickly, very efficiently on the shelf when you walk into the store. Firehouse Subs, great spot to get lunch. It's 1131 right now, so it's almost lunchtime. Go do what Chris and I do and get a great sub sandwich from Firehouse Subs. We're on Dylan Stewart as the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Rolls on on 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Founded by Firemen. With Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head. On your home of the Gamecock. 107.5 The Game. And welcome back in at the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Here on 107.5 The Game. Tyler and Wes along with you on this Wednesday morning. Wrapping up our conversation about Dylan Stewart as he has dominated the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour for now the past day and a half. Uh, one more question I want to ask you about him, Wes, is he makes this commitment to the Gamecocks yesterday. Early signing day is not for another four months where we hope he puts pen to paper on that day and can come in as an early enrollee in January and get the ball rolling with all that. We obviously know once somebody makes a verbal commitment to a school, that does not stop the other schools from coming after them. What is the next four months going to look like in terms of his recruitment from the standpoint of the other schools trying to pry him away? Yeah, you know, I I think you you always kind of put the caveat there that nothing is ever a sure thing. However, once you kind of put that out there, like Chris said earlier, this is a very low-key kid. Um, You know, he, he went through the process. He took visits. He obviously took a lot of visits. He took 10 of them to to South Carolina. So it's not like he was sitting at home, not going through the process, but he, he went through the process in a very thorough way. He didn't give himself what, what I, I think is kind of one of the things prospects shouldn't do is when they give themselves just a, uh, a deadline for no reason when they're like, Oh, I'm going to announce on August 1st. And then they're struggling to make the decision. And I'm like, nobody's making you announce on August 1st. So why, why don't you just wait? Right. You know, he didn't do that. He, he waited till he was ready. Um, I, I, I can't go into his mind, but I, I kind of think other schools are going to struggle to get him to continue to listen, uh, would, would be my guess. Um, do you, if you're South Carolina, you'll keep recruiting him sure. as if he's uncommitted, honestly, but it, it, the conversation changes a little bit. If you're South Carolina, you're talking to him like he's one of you now. Like he's he's part of the program. Yeah. And so the, the conversations on that side more become, hey, um, you know, just keeping you updated on what's going on and what things are going to look like when you get here as opposed to providing a recruiting pitch. For other schools, it's, a lot of times it's more like, hey, we're still here if you change your mind mm-hmm. or it's, Hey, why, a lot of times it's more like, Hey, why don't, why don't you come? Why don't you come for a game? There's nothing wrong with coming to a game. You know, hey, it's Ohio state. Come, you know, come watch us play this team. Yeah. And it's a, it's a little bit almost subtle, I, I think, but um, yeah, they'll keep trying. I do think he's pretty solidly committed to South Carolina from what, from what I've heard and seen. Yeah. And again, signing day is about, Four months away, so a little bit of a waiting period, but hopefully he stays committed to the Gamecocks and will be on campus very, very soon in a Gamecock uniform. As we transition now from one five-star to another, one that is on campus and ready to start his career as a Gamecock here in a couple weeks is Nicholas Harbor, who, of course, was the signing day commitment for the Gamecocks uh, back in February. Cole Kubelik, who of ESPN, as well as our sister station, Jocks FM out in Birmingham, on his podcast the other day, he went through every SEC school and talked about the thing he was most interested to see um, as every team was beginning camp. And, of course, you know, we've talked about it ad nauseum on here. Our biggest questions revolve around the offensive line, running back, you know, the edge position, and so on and so forth. His question, though, was about what Nicholas Harbor is going to be this season. Here's what Kubelik had to say. Finally, South Carolina. They get going Friday, and I'm going to make it real simple. I could give you a line. We've talked about it on the show a couple of times. Tell you things I'm worried about, not worried about. This is real easy for me, man. 
Nicholas freaking Harbor. That's it. Like, I want to know if 6'5", 230, with real track speed, I don't say that unless it's real. Like, there's fast, and then there's really fast, and then there's track speed. Never, ever confuse fast with track speed because they are different. Now, there have been very few times that track speed has had a direct carryover into football. Uh, Tim Carter was a guy at Auburn that I played with, track speed. And as he got later in his career, it started to translate a little bit more. But we had a kid that was like an almost Olympic runner who came over and tried to play football. And I think he was on kick return once with probably not the best place to put him. I think one hit in practice and he was like, I'm going back to track, man. Like we run in shorts and tank tops. I'm out. Done. So wide receiver is going to get his first go. But this is, a, this is a kid, especially with Juice Wells, man, like he could make a big difference. If he gives you just the ability to throw three, four balls down the field a game, two or three balls down the field a game, that safety's got to stay back and over on that. Like that corner's got to play off a little bit. It just opens up so much more. I want to see if he's going to be utilized, if they can trust him, if they feel good about him, because that could make a big difference for that offense. Again, that was Cole Kublik talking on his podcast the other day, and you mentioned this a little while ago. You know, we initially thought that uh, Nicholas Harbor was maybe going to be an edge guy, and he did play wide receiver a little bit in high school. It wasn't his main positions, but he does have experience doing that. Uh, I, I feel like this is something with him playing wide receiver that is going to be kind of a slow process of getting him up to speed. He's not going to go out there and have six catches against North Carolina week one. At least I don't anticipate that to happen. Would that be great if he did? Certainly. But there is going to be a little bit of a slow integration process. But, you know, when you you have a raw, natural talent like him, you're going to find a way to get him on the field sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I think it's interesting kind of going into Cole's mind there because I think he actually does as good a job as anybody out there of paying attention to the entire league. And actually, one one of my favorite tweets every week is... I think on maybe Sunday, he has a he tweets out a thought on every single team for what he saw from the previous game, and, and there's some detail in it. Like I, I don't know how he goes back and flies through all the games, but he's watched every SEC game every week, and so it is interesting coming from a national guy that Harbor is where his mind immediately went when giving a thought on South Carolina, especially considering, like you said, we've talked about it on this show, talked about it on the site a ton. What what is the realistic, what is a fair expectation for Nicholas Harbor in terms of playing time, in terms of impact? You know, and even, even in high school, man, when he was playing offense, a lot of times it was more like tight end. So playing out there in space, playing outside, like far away from the football is a little bit different. Now, Cole mentions track speed versus football speed. Maybe I'm arguing semantics here. Maybe what he means is like what he was talking about with the kickoff return. Mm -hmm. Some people don't want the physicality of football. But if you can run the way this guy can run, you can run like that on the moon. like. what that comment made me think of, do you remember Devin Allen at Oregon a couple years ago? Yes. Track guy. He's been running professionally in track, just got signed with the Eagles this past offseason, but literally he did what exactly Kublik said, where he wasn't the best route runner, but they just let him go deep. He beat the safety over the top. If they did anything short, it was a dump-off pass, and you just let his athleticism take over from there, and it worked out pretty well. Yeah, so I, if, if you can run, you can run. Yeah. And this is not something where maybe, I don't know, maybe sometimes you have a super tiny guy and like the pads and all that kind of um, affects their ability to run a little bit. But, I mean, this is a massive kid. Yeah. And so I I tend to think if you really want to kind of get into the semantics of it, what is the impact of Nicholas Harbor? He He may kind of split the difference between statistically – not coming anywhere close to making the impact your average person who just says, oh, South Carolina landed five-star Nicholas Harbor. I watched that guy on Twitter doing this, this, and this last year. He's going to catch 50 balls as a freshman. Would be very shocked if that happens. However, he may actually make a greater impact than any stat even shows 
because I I keep going back to Cole's point about running him down the field. It to me, it's not even can you hit and it two to three. You're not hitting two to three deep balls per game. Mm-hmm. Can you make them account for ten deep routes yeah. a game? Can can you work Juice Wells, Amari and Brown? Can you work those guys underneath and in e- intermediate routes? while that safety is getting taken down the field yeah. with Nick Harbour. We've talked all offseason about these tight ends, right? Trey Knox down the seam, Trey Knox over the middle by sort of vacating areas with a guy like Harbour. And I, if you're playing wide receiver and you're you're used to playing some, some linebacker, some defensive end, being a pass rusher, the physicality out there at that position just isn't what would be required you know, to, to play tight end, for example. Sure. So I, I don't think the physicality of the game is really going to be much of an issue. Now, special teams, d- does he make an impact there? Does he not? That's sort of probably where you're getting more into the physicality of it. Do you even want him getting beat up playing special teams? I think that's a conversation you have. So, um, but, but very intriguing to me, very interesting to me that that's where Cole's mind went was, hey, what's this Nick Harbour guy going to do? But he, he could catch... 13 passes Mm -hmm. this year and really help this offense. Yeah. I I don't think it's It's, a statistical thing. It's kind of similar to one of those things when you look at like a defensive back, like, ah, well, he didn't put up any stats for the entire game. Yeah, because they didn't throw to his side of the field because he's such a shutdown cornerback or whatever it may be. Kind of a similar thing there that, yeah, the statistics may not jump off off the page at you, but what he's able to do in pulling attention away from a Juice Wells, from an Xavier Lorget, could go really far for this offense. And and add some. Quite obviously, some speed, but I, I, I look at, I look at this offense. I look at this overall team. When Beamer got here, I thought that was a key missing component was overall team speed. Now you add him potentially to the field. Leggett is as fast as anybody for his size. Mm-hmm. Um, Knox is fast in terms of tight ends. Simon can run. Marion Brown can run. Juice Wells isn't a burner just because he kind of does everything, but he's, I mean, he's plenty fast enough. Right. You start to think about what, what does what does DJ Braswell do at running back this year and possibly adding some speed as the year goes on there. Very quickly, you could have an offense that, that does have a speed component that frankly just was not there before. And I, when I said that initially, I'm talking about the whole team. I think they got to continue to add speed on on defense as well. But um, that, to me, is something that you could look back on and say is much improved versus what the roster looked like when Beamer first arrived in Columbia. Absolutely. Well, Nick, uh, Harbor's certainly going to be one of those guys going to be watching out uh, through camp over the next couple weeks and certainly when the season get started. We'll come back on the other side, wrap up today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs on 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. 107.5 The Game. Guys, football season is right around the corner. I know Colin Taylor does not enjoy the countdown. I he's do. He's okay with it now. He, he's okay now? Yeah, now that we're within a month, he's he's alright with it. Okay, what what is our countdown right now, Tyler? 30, 31 days. Okay, you have... 31 days to upgrade, whether it's the man cave, whether it is the garage, whether it is the outside. Uh, a lot of people have this outside kitchen and area to, to watch games. Wherever it is that you are hosting your friends and family for football this year, you got just over a month to call our friends at Integrated Media in Chapin, South Carolina, and help them upgrade your audio visual. That can be a new TV. Maybe you bought the new TV, but you want it mounted somewhere and you're a little bit iffy about putting that brand new expensive TV on the wall because you don't trust yourself. They can handle that for you. Maybe you want to hide the cords. That My wife hates all the cords that I have. So she wants those hidden. You can hide those in the wall. Integrated Media can handle that for you as well. 803-948-8327, integratedmediainc.com. Anything audio visual in your home, anything involving smart home, security systems, your internet, streaming, they can help walk you through that process and make it very, very simple for you. So do what I'm going to do soon. I'm about to upgrade the home office. Integrated Media is going to be at my house. I'm going to tell you all about that at a later date. They can do that for you too. IntegratedMediaInc.com. EA Sports clapping back. Talk about it next. Gamecock Central Takeover presented by Firehouse Subs. 
Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Founded by Firemen. With Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head. On your home of the Gamecocks. 107.5 The Game. Welcome back into the Gamecocks Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Here on 107.5 Game. Tyler and Wes along with you for a few more minutes. We're turning things over to Jay and Terry. For the halftime show, of course, Wes and I keep our eyes on anything EA Sports related as we are closing in on the return of the college football video game in the summer of 2024. This story coming out from Pete Nakos of On3 a couple of hours ago. EA Sports has filed a motion to dismiss the Brander Group's lawsuit calling the licensing company's move nonsensical. This all related to the Brander Group, which represents 54 Division I institutions for their name, image, and likeness dealings, uh, filing lawsuit against EA Sports um, in relation to them trying to include players in their game in 2024. EA's uh, motion to dismiss the lawsuit, uh, part of it said, Brander's tortious interference claims fail because by the template's terms, student-athletes retain the right to individually license their name, image, and likeness. Yeah, so we need our boy Pascal, who is on Garnet Trust. He would have been the perfect person yes. to ask about this. To, to translate this for us. But basically, I believe they're saying your argument sucks. Yeah, nice try. Yeah, but in all seriousness, they're basically saying, look, us doing this deal does does not take, it's not an exclusive deal. The players can still go out and uh, and do whatever they, I, I assume this was going to be a group licensing deal, sure. but um actually it appears this is going to be an individual deal with every single player yes who's going to be in the game then you have group licenses with the universities for mm-hmm. their intellectual properties so uh kind of interesting how they structure this thing but uh the game is still it, it's had its hurdles but it is still on track and i am slowly setting aside money to buy a PlayStation 5 at some point in 2024. Well, hopefully they're available by then. Hopefully so. <laughs> but we'll continue to keep our eye on this as this story continues to evolve heading into next summer. But that'll do it for today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Halftime Show with Jane Terry up next on 107.5 The Game.